Hello, Catherine Dunn fans. Welcome to the Center for Fiction. My name is Melanie McNair. I'm the Senior Director of Public Programming. Do not be afraid to come to the front. Nobody, um, well, I don't know. I can't promise what's going to happen or not. Um, for those of you who don't know us, the Center for Fiction is the only literary nonprofit that focuses on the creation and enjoyment of fiction. Um, and we particularly love to celebrate um, books and uh, by authors who are no longer with us as we are also a library. As you can see, there's lots of books by people who are no longer with us around you. Um, so check us out. Uh, if you become a member, you can check out books and also use the amazing member space upstairs. Also an announcement that this week, uh, the tickets for our first novel FET, which is like the biggest literary party of the year, went on sale, and that is on December 2nd this year, and it's always a ton of fun. There's a free boot, well, you pay a ticket, and then you get like an open bar, and uh, literary readings, and tarot card readings, and just all kinds of people from publishing are here, and it's really fun. Um, just a couple of, how, well, one housekeeping announcement really is that we will have an audience Q&A this evening, and if you want to ask a question, just raise your hand, and one of our interns will bring a microphone to you so that the people on YouTube can hear you as well. Um, so even if they can hear you on stage, make sure you wait until the microphone so that the live stream people can hear you. And those of you on the live stream, hello. Uh, you can just type your question in the chat at any time, and we'll try to read one or two of those before we wrap up the evening. Uh, let me introduce our fabulous panel this evening. Hallie Butler is the author of Jillian and the New Me. She is a Granta Best Young American Novelist and a National Book Foundation Five Under 35 honoree. Molly Crabapple is an artist and writer based in New York. She is the author of two books, Drawing Blood and Brothers of the Gun, which was long listed for a National Book Award in 2018. Her reportage has been published in the New York Times, the New York Review of Books, the Parish Review, Vanity Fair, The Guardian, Rolling Stone, The New Yorker, and elsewhere. Her art is in the permanent collections of the Museum of Modern Art. Her animations have been nominated for three Emmys and won an Edward R. Murrow Award. And uh, to moderate our panel, Naomi Huffman. She's a writer and editor who lives in Brooklyn. Her work has appeared in the New York Times Book Review, the New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic, GQ, Book Forum, The Believer, Sense, and elsewhere. She began transcribing Dunn's short stories housed in the archives at Lewis and Clark College in 2018, and she's the editor, editor of two of Dunn's previously unpublished books, including Toad, which we're talking about tonight, and Near Flesh Stories, which is forthcoming in 2023. Please welcome them all to the stage. here with the two of you tonight and to be with everyone here. Um, I've uh, had the good fortune of talking to a lot of people in the last couple of years who are huge fans of Dunn and to whom Dunn meant quite a lot. So I know that they um, are also really happy that, that you're here tonight. Um, I want to jump in uh, right away uh, just talking about Catherine Dunn's legacy and what she means to both of you. Um, Molly, in your foreword for the book, you wrote, uh, over 30 years after its publication, Geek Love is a totem for outcasts born and made the world over. In my own misspent youth, I memorized Geek Love the way British boys memorized the Odyssey. I also wanted to find my fictional forebears. For weird kids like me, Geek Love was both a respite and a weapon. Um, what was your introduction to Dunn? When did she come into your life? And um, how did you first encounter her work? I had a friend in my early 20s who I thought was the most fabulous thing. She had neon pink hair, dubious employment, and a tattoo sleeve, the main part of which was a, a tattoo of the conjoined twins in Geek Love. 
And I remember I was staring at her arm one day after we had snuck into some party we didn't belong at. And I was like, what is that? Tell me. And she's like, you haven't read Geek Love? What's wrong with you? <laughs> and um, so, of course, I got a copy. Mm -hmm. And I remember opening up those first pages where they're talking about Al and Crystal Lil making babies with radioactive waste and making freaks that would stand in proud defiance to the boring straight world. And I was like, this is my, this is my people, right? I was, I was a burlesque dancer. I was a fire eater. Um, I would like uh, walk topless on broken glass. You know, this is what people did in the early 2000s for attention. And um, when you were backstage at a sideshow or at a burlesque place, you know, at a, uh, a more alt strip club, the book that was the single most likely to be mentioned was Geek Love, because all of us weird girls have read it, and all of us weird girls have fallen in love with it. So that was, that was my introduction. Yeah. Hallie, what about you? Oh, I think my mom gave it to me. <laughs> <laughs> Which is cool, like, Hallie. You know, like, yeah, I'm not bold. The truth is often bold. Um, uh, <laughs> you know, I wasn't much of a reader until my 20s. and. I guess my mom thought maybe I should be reading more and so she gave me Geek Love and it was my senior year of high school and I was doing a lot of nude figure drawing at the time mm -hmm. trying to get into art school and I was in Detroit at like the um, portfolio day where they tell you if you can get into art school or not um, <laughs> and so I was just standing in this massively long line of nervous 17 year olds with like my portfolio just like reading love um, and it was definitely one of the first books that I was like oh, okay this is great I don't know what this is but it's great um, and it's been interesting to reread it as an adult because I'm noticing like what was affecting me all these things about like being on the outside mm. um, but like figuring out how to be on the inside by maybe being a little bit mean and conniving, but then being like, oh, but like, I'm so like, ah. There's, there's something about the way that she is writing about uh, using your outsiderness as like a, like a strength to lord over other people that was certainly appealing to me at the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. What were your first impressions of her style, of her voice? Do you remember it, distinguishing um, Geek Love in your in your reading life from other books at that time based on on those things? Well, I mean, her style is pyrotechnic. If I had to make a comparison, it wouldn't even necessarily be to like other books. It'd be like a Tom Waits song, you know, <laughs> made into a novel. Um, in my forward, I say it was like like what like a honky tonk pasties and a G string type book. You know, mm -hmm. it's. Like, like she just like plays you and moves you and like disgusts and seduces you at once. And what you were saying also about like using your outsiderness to be a little mean to get on the insider to get power. I think that's one of the things that's most appealing about her work to outsiders because she's not like, oh, you poor virtuous victim. Let me, you know, why don't you say how sorry you feel for yourself and supplicate the world? She's like, you know, you're a freak and that makes you better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Uh, <laughs> totally. Really fun to lean into that, like at the you know beginning of your journey into yeah, adulthood yeah, yeah. too. Um, and I think her writing has that quality of like total intimacy that I really respond well to in books. I feel like she's really inside my head. You know, I'm not. I'm not thinking about anything else when I'm reading Geek Love or Toad. Um, I'm in there and I feel like she's just like talking directly to me and it gives the book this quality of being completely alive that I think is really rare in books and when it happens, when it just like kind of makes you want to start like screaming because <laughs> it's like, ah, like why are you doing this to me? Uh, it's just, it's so, I don't know exactly how she does it, but I think that it has something to do with being really honest and just like uh, she's not pulling any punches and she's being really honest about characters who especially in geek love don't resemble your normal world if you're you know like a high school kid from michigan um uh but it also like in 
totally resembles your world. I, I don't know. She's. I mean, I think of, also a lot of it is because she had a super like poor to working class background. Catherine Dunn's mom was a sharecropper. She ran away from home when she was sixteen. She uh, spent um, a bit of time, like a short stint of time in jail for passing bad checks. Uh, when she was a single mother in Portland, she worked every single possible job from uh, rolling candy wrappers in factories to painting houses uh, to a nude model. She uh, worked as a bartender in a Hell's Angel bar where she had to de-escalate knife fights. She wasn't just like some product of the Iowa writing workshop, you know? She was someone who had lived life in all of its extremes, and I think that really shows in her writing, and especially in like the physicality of it. Yeah. She's, to she's totally 100% in on these books, <laughs> and yeah. it really comes across. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was having a conversation earlier this year with a writer who was just, you know, saying that there was just no other book that committed so hard to uh, its concepts as geek love. And I think that's true of Toad as well. And I think it's so rare to read contemporary fiction that commits to its own concepts as strongly as, as she does. So. Well, we think of Dunn today as a cult favorite, right? That's why we're all here. Um, she won a national, or she was nominated for a National Book Award and uh, the Bram Stoker, the year that Geek Love came out. But um, her earlier novels were panned, and Geek Love wasn't resoundingly loved either. Uh, critics didn't really take to it uh, resoundingly. Um, in, in a review of Attic, um, which is her first novel, and um, just briefly, the premise of that book is that a young woman is incarcerated after writing a bad check. Um, one critic said of, of Attic, uh, one thing is incontestably going on here. A contemporary novel is being written by a young writer. <laughs> the, attempt <to> burn. <laughs> the attempt to reproduce the confusion and simultaneity of experience as it happens and the surreal imagery all make for a turned-on contemporary idiom that bears some resemblance, if not scrutinized too closely, to formal innovation. Locked up in the ho hopeless lesbian world of the prison, <laughs> the narrator... I want to be locked up in the hopeless lesbian I know, right? world. That sounds <laughs> fun. Um, the narrator regresses to fantasy, to an infantile preoccupation with the mother, with food, and with the mysterious openings and functions of her own body. Um, what do we make of the reception of her early work and of, of Geek Love, maybe, as well? I mean, that sounds like a prissy little bitch wrote that, sorry. <laughs> Yeah. It's an, <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. It's an artful <laughs> review. Um, do we, do we think Dunn was ahead of her time? Oh, after reading Toad? I mean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think I, I, uh, I haven't read Attic, but let me talk about it. I don't know. It just sounds like, I mean, it just sounds like Jean Genet, you know, being in prison and just being like, I'm in prison. Let me write about my body in prison. Mm -hmm. And that's. It wasn't something stuff. she was also allowed yeah. to do, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, well, I have with me some of the rejection letters that Catherine Dunn received when she was shopping Toad. Um, she wrote Toad in the early 1970s and started um, trying to attract agents in the mid-70s and then went out on her own to try to find an editor and a publishing house. Um, as, as far as I can tell, as, as early as 1976. Or 1976. Um, and um, yeah, I thought it, it might be fun to read some of these rejections because I think they help set the context in which she was trying to publish books and the expectations that editors had at that time of, of women's writing. Um, an editor, uh, whose name I, I won't mention at this time, uh, from St. <laughs> Martin's Press said that the problem is not sentence by sentence or scene by scene, but the overall structure of the book. It seems to be basically autobiographical, by which I mean that things are there not for any reason except that they happened. In that sense, the book is not artificial enough. The material has to be more worked into a theme and a story. Uh, this editor goes on to say that the stumbling block is that after one finishes reading the novel, one can still say, so what? What difference does it make, and why should the reader care? Um, yeah, what do you think about that response? In many ways, it reminds me of how women's fiction is always presumed to be autobiographical, mm. um, as if like they can't, you know, construct plot, construct characters without 
uh, leaning on their own experience. I think it's a critique that a lot of um, women writers have gotten and you know, stu based on stupid assumptions. But the other thing is like, what is he saying? He's saying that there's supposed to be an edifying lesson at the end of the book, that there's supposed to be like a likable narrator that um, you know, moves um, according to a structure that leads you to a moral conclusion that like, I don't, I don't understand this critique. Do you have anything to add? Oh, yeah, I don't want to spoil the book. Uh, yeah, I guess it's, I, it's safe to say I don't agree. Um, <laughs> I, I, I feel like the questions are in the questions in Toad are really kind of subtle if you haven't lived them, but if you have lived these questions that are in Toad about internalized misogyny and like longing to be a part of a group that doesn't accept you because you're not a guy or the object of desire of a guy, you have to figure out another way to join the group, which is something that she really goes to continue to develop in Geek Love. But like it's all there in Toad and these are really interesting questions that are moving and well written and like you could even make a case that toad is like you know it like boils really slowly like it's toad you know it's like you're you're there and you're like okay why am i reading oh why am i reading this oh why am i reading this why am i reading this you know it's yeah. i think it does i don't want to spoil too much but. i mean there is a moral lesson at the end which like we wouldn't spoil but i think would you say that yeah I think, yeah, well, it's uh, yeah, like it's not a moral lesson in like, and this is how you should live. It's sort of like, like, am I forgivable? Yeah. And I think you sort of walk away from the end of Toad being like, like asking that question about your own, you know, misspent youth yeah. too. And I think these are really profound questions that are, they're profound and meaningful questions. <laughs> I mean, what, what you were saying about like belonging to a group also, um, there's like two levels of that because first, as you said, you know, there's like she can't belong to the group because she's not a guy or a, you know, a hottie that the guys want to bang, right? But also, she doesn't belong to the group because they're all a bunch of rich kids at Reed. They're all, and she's not. She's a poor girl. And I think like that is the, the, one of the things that brings most autobiographically true about it, which is that um, Catherine Dunn was a poor girl who got in, who actually got into read, unlike Sally Guthers, the the protagonist of Toad, and presumably felt ill at ease when surrounded by like these these super rich kids and this mm -hmm. super like rich but hippie bohemian atmosphere of uh, read at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There's that great scene. Well, we're not talking about Toad quite yet, but there is a great scene in Toad where um, uh, the main male hippie character, Sam, um, is like, oh, I've met this wacky guy. He's so interesting. Like, he's so, he's just like so poor. He's so off the land. He's so like primitive. And it's like, well, that's my brother. <laughs> so, so they're kind of like uh, performing what she is in a way that doesn't give her access to it. And that feels really complicated too. Yeah, maybe really quickly we should just summarize. Toad. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's likely that not everyone here tonight has, has had a chance to read it. Um, Toad is about um, Sally Gunner, a woman who is in her middle age. She's created this uh, life for herself in which she doesn't have to leave her house. She kind of just hangs out with these goldfish that she keeps in a jar. There's the titular toad that lives in her garden. Um, there's a cleaning salesman that visits her once a month. Um, every now and then she's visited by like her brother or sister-in-law, but for the most part, um, she lives a very isolated life, and, and this is the life that she wants to live. She's, she's really put a lot of effort into putting this life together. Um, but while she's at home, she reflects back on basically two time periods in her life. One, when she was a student at Reed College, met Sam, met Carlotta, Sam's uh, later girlfriend. Um, and then also this time in her 30s where she was kind of moving between um, very unsatisfying relationships with men. Um, do we want to read some sections of Toad, actually? Sure, I'll okay. read. Cool. Um, can, here, yeah. oh, which one's the dog? That one's yours. Is in the <laughs> Puff. The smoke from my cigarette is lovely. 
a flat, pale drift catching light in dark places. Harmlessness. I am in here trying to be harmless. That is, after all, the primary attraction of my seclusion. To move and sleep and fling my arms out, no matter how soft the soft undersides swing. To mutter serious nonsense at the fish and flowers and walls and windows. To giggle and stamp with sensuality on the ghastly bodies of slugs and the grinding, clicking snails. In all this coiling self, this child's indulgence, I would like to injure no one, cause no discernible pain. I turn my back, of course, on the pain of the gastropods. I want to see no flinch or change of pulse as the result of my most flagrant acts. I never want to roil the bed sheets as I relive the embarrassment of some stupid moment where my vanity fell crooked on an unsuspecting head. Exuberance has always been a problem of mine. It mutes my judgment or strangles it. Each blast of idiocy or malice snaps back and chips me till I am sadly maimed and disfigured. Do not mistake, I have meant harm in my time. Poor Moira Clancy. I certainly meant her harm. And there have been others, but so many were accidents, misjudgments, the result of my carelessness and stupidity. How many million tumbling words I've let loose without first noticing their particular toxicity. Fortunately, I forget a lot. And what is left to remember is enough to keep me here. I seek out no one, and those who come to me, like visitors to an aging cobra, accept their hazards. That's such a good part of this book. <laughs> that's, uh, oh, I'm so sorry. I just wanted to say that that's her, um, that's her from the, her oldest, um, so that's sort of like the present tense uh, narrative when she's 60, younger. It's unclear. Unclear. She's, yeah, she's yeah. older, uh, describing the pleasures of her isolation. I love that part. Yeah. Sorry. Like an aging cobra. Oh, so good. I know. I uh, was just going to ask, why did you want to read that selection? What resonates with you about it? I mean, first of all, I, I just love her prose. Um, but in addition to that, it reminds me of something that um, you were saying earlier about her talking about how people who are other, people who are outside, can still be mean and mean harm. And I think that she writes about that so beautifully that even though she's in isolation now, trying to presumably like, protect other people from herself, mm -hmm. she is never in this book um, a victim. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want to go or should I go? Um, sure, go ahead. <laughs> um, I'm going to read, this is from really early on, page 29. This was the first part where I was like, oh, OK. This is going to be for me. Um, <clears throat> she's young in this part. A rumor went around that Sam had found a tame junkie. Uh, he had made a pet of a heroin addict, took her in to live with him, and set up visiting hours for putting her on display. Weeks went by in which I did not see Sam, but heard of him several times a day. Have you met Belle, someone might ask, or have you seen Sam's junkie? Or more discreetly, have you been over to Sam's place recently? <laughs> All this as a prelude to reverent descriptions of the way Belle ate brown sugar straight from the box with a spoon, or how she nodded into unconsciousness on the sofa immediately after playing her guitar and singing for a group of guests. It was one of her drawing cards that she played and sang her own songs. I took an immediate dislike to the whole business. There was a lot of pious awe going around in those days, and it set me against whatever it was directed at. Even now, the word Zen triggers a reflexive sneer, and the most academic use of the word enlightenment blights my very digestion. Drugs and folk music were two topics that always drew blathering mysticism from the dark heart of every student house and dormitory. There were dozens who found some pretext to visit Sam so they could sit worshiping their new ideas and get high. All of the students seemed to use hallucinogens, but heroin was holy by way of being fatal. 
Still, I was jealous. Sam had hit upon something so much more colorful and gratifying than I could ever offer, and I despised him at last for being taken in, as I fancied it. I didn't go to see him, and he, enveloped in the lively fascination he inspired, certainly did not seek me out. Yeah. <laughs> what, 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 like, electrified you when you read that? How um, did you know that that was when you were going to like Toad? Well, because sometimes, uh, I guess, uh, sometimes the words Zen and Enlightenment make me feel similar ways. Or I just, <laughs> I, I feel like that was the moment when I was like, oh, okay, we're going to have this kind of angle on Sam and it starts really slowly and it's like when we're starting to see that his charming boyish uh, free thinking ways have a little bit gotten under her skin mm -hmm. and then I I was like okay I'm gonna like this yeah what do you think that scene says about the uh, time place in which Toad takes place? What comment do you think she's making on that era of America? Um, I think she's saying that students are doing a bunch of drugs and thinking that that means that they're geniuses. <laughs> <laughs> which is, it could be said of many times, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I think particularly like the, you know, West Coast hippies, 60s, like free love, uh, like a commune utopia type mm -hmm. thing um, is in that section, you know, being laid out as the setting place of the book. And she's presenting this, this angle mm -hmm. on it that's not at all admiring. But it's, I don't know, actually too many books from the woman's too many novels from a woman's perspective from that time, do you? I mean, not off the top of my head. I think the thing that really shocks me about um, her perspective on that time in America is that she wrote this, um, as, as far as I can tell, um, with like five to seven years of removal from um, you know, the disappointments of like the women's liberation movement. And I think she so presciently describes um, and, and very subtly too, those disappointments. And I think it's it's just astonishing to me that it comes through so clearly. And, and that that's like a lot of, I think, what resonates uh, with me about the book, reading it now. We know very well how uh, the late 1960s and early 70s and the movements at that time, how that panned out for women. Um, it's our reality today, which we're all um, dealing with. And I think in, in this year in particular feels um, perhaps more harrowing than it ever has in our lifetime. Um, yeah, I just, that's one thing about that scene in particular that yeah. begins to build. Well, the bell, like what, the bell is sort of more like a, like a beautiful pet that you, everybody's coming to like look at her, you know, that's strange. And so Sally is seeing the options. Uh, yeah. And yeah. I'll read the part of Toad that I had selected. Um, I guess like Hallie, this is the scene. Um, the first time I read it, I was like, I, I have to publish this book. Um, the chapter title is called The Raised Blade. There came a day I was in no way prepared for. 16 years had passed since I had seen Sam and Carlotta. I was 36 years old and living in Boston. Time had ripped me out of my holdings, out of my natural domain, and stranded me on my back, looking at a horizon altogether too far away. I had blunted my mind beneath blossoming trees and written my little books in feeble defiance of mortality. I had spun exuberant lies and told crass truths, all to avoid pain and unpleasant incidents. I had dutifully loved and later settled for not loving. After years thick with colorful scenes and fat phantasmagoria, my life had gone gray, dull, and bereft of my own will, an abandonment of volition that carried me into the cold and out again, like a sand flea in the surf. I had spent the past many months pursuing a young man, a poet, Jack. He was beautiful, and he despised me. First, I had given him money. When the money ran out, I went to work again at odd jobs that seemed to separate me from him for more than the hours accounted for. 
While I was away, he took long walks or visited old girlfriends. He spoke well, too, and was a loyalist, novel after all of my years with revolutionaries. He disliked my name and changed it. Sally, he refused and referred to me, when necessary, as Miss Gunner. For months, I had tailed him. Eventually, I moved in with him and ignored his talk of previous affairs and his sick, hungry staring at slim women. I was fat by then, no longer just round, but thickening and clumsy. I told him once that I didn't care if he kept girls hanging on strings from the window ledge as long as I was one of them. It was not true, but it would have taken a lot of damage to mar him for me. I chose to accept his faults and keep him near. I always thought of him as pacing, but in fact, most of the time he sat very still. He was starkly beautiful with his feet, with his feet up and the blank pain of boredom on his face. His jaws and lips and nose were so delicately cut that sometimes, as he slept, I would examine his face, marveling at its perfection. I was weakened by my love for him, and he was utterly miserable, stuck with me, and by the small degree of comfort I could offer him with my money and my willingness to work for him, and the cloying amiability of my devotion. He was not proud to be with me. I was too fat, my laugh was too coarse. My occasional melodramatic weeping, you can't love someone like me, all too easily explained what we both felt. He responded by dutifully patting my head. He was unable to say what I needed to hear due to a lack of facility or his inclination toward lying, which only made him more appealing to me. Even as he patted and stroked my hair, he stared at the wall with a sick expression, yearning to be somewhere else. Now all those years, I had never had an orgasm that was not self-induced. 57 men, I had counted, too many for comfort and only a few of any interest, had come with my cooperation but made no dent on my pleasures. The exercise was necessary for my sanity. It reassured me and let me sleep. I sought it out with ravenous energy, but on just as many nights, when my desires were urgent and specific, I rubbed myself into quick peaks of relief. But this fellow, the 57th, it is definitely unseemly to have kept count, had a quality of pride and a knowledge that the others had not. He was the first to rouse me, to make me run between the legs, even with only a look. One night, he had been fooling with me for a while and stumbled upon the right place, the place, and set me off. I was surprised, and then I was wild with anticipation. I cried out, this time for real. I had pretended thousands of orgasms in my time. <laughs> Arched my back and trembled and rattled my heels, moaned, laughed, raked my nails, all to simulate the only models I had from literature. But at last, I was undone. My orgasm was real. I gave in. I grabbed his hand to keep him from losing his place. I gripped his hair, my hips stiffened. He went on for some time, and my hand slid down to keep him there. But he was insulted by my obvious enthusiasm. He must have realized I had been performing before. It disgusted him. Do it yourself then, he said, his bitter voice a bludgeon, and he rolled away from me, furious. Um, yeah, this goes on for a while longer, but um, <laughs> I'll stop there. Uh, and and yeah, it's a major plot point. It is yeah. a major plot point. It sets in motion. I mean, I, all of the threat is expressed in the title, The Raised Blade. Um, nothing good <laughs> comes next. But um, I mean, I was just like, what woman was writing about sex this way in this time? Like, it, it's wild to me that... Um, she was writing this bravely, and, but it's also unsurprising. I mean, when we look back at her other books, at Attic and Truck, I mean, there's just so much, there's so much brassiness in her writing. There's so much daring, and there's so much personality. Um, we were talking before uh, this, this conversation um, just about how singular Dunn is and how unmatched her voice is by any other writer, and I think that to me, that fact to me is just really underlined in, in the passage I just read. And also, I think the thing that um, makes it unusual is that the character, she's utterly unconcerned with writing Sally as someone who's desirable. Mm -hmm. Sally gets to desire without being desirable. Mm -hmm. And she um, gets to fuck, she gets to feel lust, she gets to want people that don't want her. And that's something, and, and she's seen from the inside. And I feel like that's something that was rare, especially in you know women's fiction of that time or even before. Like, I, I, it's very hard for me to think of a character like Sally. Yeah, yeah, totally. Do you have anything to add? No, 
I agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, should we talk about some of the affinities between Toad and Geek Love? Um, yeah, okay. yeah, obviously. <laughs> Do you want to get us started? Um, uh, okay, so one of the things that was so exciting for me about Toad being a Geek Love fan was how similar they are uh, structurally, thematically. Uh, I just, I think it was really exciting for me to see, Toad stands on its own, and it's a really marvelous book, but it's so exciting to see how she went from, like, you know, the early books to Geek Love, like, just structurally going back and forth between these two, like, present and past places. I mean, structurally, it's really quite similar, don't you think? Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. it's, it's exciting to watch the progress. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that was, um, I think my familiarity and the fact that I had read Geek Love so many times was actually quite helpful in editing Toad. I was able to, I was able to like recognize that that, um, that structure, that framing device was in place in Toad, but just needed to be organized a little bit better, uh, that the past, um, the, the flashbacks to the past needed to be braided in uh, with a little bit of a, a stronger sense of plot or a, um, a sense of chronology. and. In so many ways, I was just so grateful that I had read Geek Love so many times and so so closely because that was definitely what helped me. May, may I ask a question? Sure. Um, what's it like to edit a novel when the writer is no longer alive? Yeah, it was terrifying. <laughs> I mean, I um, I don't think I was totally prepared for how, how scary that process would be. I was um, just really excited to get to work on the projects, but then once they were acquired and I had to face the work of editing them, I was really daunted, um, so much so that for like uh, the first couple of months that I was supposed to be working on it, I just wasn't. I was uh, working on editing the stories instead, uh, which at, at that time, and this was um, early 2020, um, I was still working on transcribing some of those stories, which means many of them had been typewritten, some of them had been handwritten, um, but there wasn't like a, a, digitable, a digital like Word doc, for instance, and, and they all needed to be uh, transferred to that format. Um, and editing, uh, or I guess like the, the transcription of those stories and immersing myself so closely in her voice each day, just really writing out um, her writing was actually a way of, of feeling close enough to her to begin to try to make decisions about her work when she wasn't there. Um, but yeah, it felt, I mean, I think at the time I was like going around to friends and saying things like, editing is violence. <laughs> it's just like, how do I do this? How do I, there's no conversation. There's no, um, you know, there's no one else there to mirror back to me that these are the right decisions. So, yeah. What, um, what did it, what state was it in when you got it? Yeah, um, so there is a, uh, a, a like group of friends that, that Catherine has in Portland who uh, were really a, a huge part of, of getting her work into print. Um, the manuscript, from what I understand, was mostly typewritten with um, lots of handwritten passages and, and revising. Um, I've seen the images of that manuscript, but um, Eli, her son, and, and this group of friends, many of whom were people who edited her or worked alongside her, um, went to the boxing gym with her. Uh, these people sat down and, and transcribed it for me so that I had a, work, a Word document to work with and, and that was hugely helpful. But they did maintain um, many of her asides and many of her notes, which were pleasurable to read, of course. Um, but then, yeah, I had to figure out what to do with that. So. That's amazing. That's so cool. <laughs> I, yeah, I, well, uh, I, I'm thinking about Geek Love too because they are, I think it's, yeah, it's, you did, I don't know how much uh, structural rearranging you did, but it is just so Catherine Dunn, mm -hmm. you know, the way that it exists. Um, and it was exciting to me that the characters all seemed kind of similar, like Sam, who's the hippie character in Toad, seems very much like Al, uh, you know, the from father, Geek Love, Geek the Love, dad yeah. from Geek Love, and uh, Sally, of course. Sally, <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and so it's exciting to see these moments where, uh, like, Sally in Toad is uh, like, like making herself 
like cry with all the snot coming down and then to like see how this is like being transformed in geek love into these like more like overly like symbolic things with like the twins and uh, I'm rambling a little bit but but I feel like there there are character marryings in these two books too mm -hmm. and was were you thinking about the characters with the editing yeah um I definitely was. Um, it seemed important to retain everyone. Um, you know, I had some suggestions that maybe there were characters that could be cut, um, mostly side characters who didn't really make um, much of an appearance in the book. But for the most part, um, everyone is is in place, and um, it, it did. I, I think a lot of the the similarities with Geek Love. Um, like resonated with me more and more over time. The more drafts I did of the book and the more the more revisions I did and um, yeah, the more I could see how, I think you said it earlier best that Dunn could not have written Geek Love without having first written Toad. Um, especially a lot of the, the structural editing. Um, just the fact that Geek Love was divided into books or parts, like it felt you know very straightforward then to impose that same kind of part organization in Toad. Um, that the chapter titles of Geek Love are just like so voicey and, and sometimes pulled straight from the text. I tried to emulate that as well as I could. Um, you did the chapter titles? Wow. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't have revealed that. <laughs> no, they feel so, I feel like you're, you were possessed by her. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Um, well, it just seemed um, important to me to follow that structure. I mean, it felt like, totally. in some ways, the safest thing, but also, hopefully, what she also would have done. So. Yeah. For me, like the thing that stuck out as a similarity between uh, Geek Love and Toad was um, how they both dealt with like femininity and conventional mm -hmm. femininity. Because one of the characters in um, Toad is this absolutely beautiful sort of ideal hippie girl you know with long straight hair and a cool suede outfit named Carlotta who's an object of desire and um, I won't give away what happens to Carlotta but um, all of her beauty and sort of femini femininity and openness is not going to actually um, pan out for her well and the iconic characters in Geek Love uh, were those twins, the two beautiful Siamese twins. Um, it's Iffy and Ellie. Iffy and Ellie, Iffy and Ellie um, that are tattooed on countless you know, burlesque chicks' arms. And these twins also are ones whose beauty will ultimately not get them anything. Mm -hmm. In fact, it will only get them startling violence. And I think it's telling that in both um, Geek Love and in Toad, you know, the ugly girl is the one that gets all the good lines and the one that will survive. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I think there's a scene that you recount in your foreword where Carl Carlotta is just like, she's stepped in dog shit. And well, she's she, dancing. She's dancing, yes. She's dancing, importantly. And um, she kind of doesn't want anyone to know that she's stepped in dog shit, of course, that's humiliating. And so she's just like dancing away. And, and she's barefoot, to, like, by the way, as well. She's barefoot, yes, yeah. good detail. Um, <laughs> and she's just trying to like smear yeah. this literal shit off of her foot. And it just seems like such a, a wonderful summation of the point that you're making. Like, beauty only gets you dog shit in yeah. Dunn's world. Yeah. <laughs> but observing the dog shit on the beautiful girl's foot does not get Sally the guy she it's wants. <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> um, we're almost out of time before we go to the Q&A. Um, did we cover everything that you guys wanted um, to cover? I think Toad is a really fantastic book, and I'm can't believe that it didn't ex exist for people to read in bookstores before this. And thank you for doing this. Yeah, thank we talk you about so much. That really quickly, though. Yeah. Or if we can. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We, have <laughs> we, have 30, we have forty seconds. seconds. Forty seconds. Um, no, I, I would love to hear from you guys why you think Toad wasn't. I mean, we read a little bit of it in the rejections, but why did Toad not resonate in the nineteen seventies with editors, and why does it now? Maybe they were all Sam. <laughs> a bunch of Sams in publishing. <laughs> Sounds about right. I don't know. It's a mystery. But I do think that it's we can read it now. Yeah. You know, I, I guess I feel like that's that matters 
to me. Mm -hmm. I, I think that makes me feel good about all of the books that we're not getting to read right now that someday we'll get to read them or someone will get to read them. I don't know. I just, I'm just very happy that it's, yeah, that yeah. it's being taken care of because yeah. it's a really great book that I think you all enjoy. It's, yeah. it's amazing. Um, maybe before we go to the Q&A, I do want to read one um, last kind of hilarious response from um, an editor at Huffton Mifflin. Um, I think this really helps ground uh, the perspective from which editors were uh, responding to Catherine Dunn at that time. Um, this is a, a PS at the end of a, a, uh, uh, some correspondence with an editor. In view of your, shall we say, troubled relationship with your typewriter, and I suspect typewriters in general, don't you think perhaps it might be useful and soothing to take one of those summer typing courses they give at places <laughs> like high schools and YMCAs? I did it once as an impulsive, youthful stab at self-improvement and found it less embarrassing than I expected and sort of fun, actually, not to mention the fact that it increased my market value by about a thousand percent. I drew the line at shorthand, though. Just a suggestion, I love your penmanship. Um, That's a real thanks. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think we're ready for the Q&A. Does anybody have any questions for us? If you have a question, you can just raise your hand and we'll come over to you with a microphone. Um, sorry. How did you discover the manuscript? That's a good question, Wolfgang. <laughs> um, I actually, uh, in 2019, um, or 2018 actually, I had uh, reread Geek Love, I think for the fourth time, um, and uh, had just found out about the existence of Attic and Truck. I hadn't really researched Dunn very much before that time. Um, was able to procure copies on the internet, read them feverishly, back to back, was totally in love with them, but did note that they were published um, in the late uh, 1960s, early 1970s, and that Geek Love, her best known work, of course, like hadn't been published until 20 years after that time. So um, I was just curious about what a writer of uh, Dunn's talent and, and quality was, was doing in the interim. So I just Googled uh, Catherine Dunn archive one night, and. Um, was uh, just you know blown away by this this list of short stories that I found uh, in her archive catalog just there on the internet. Um, so I got in touch with the archive um, at the time I was working at FSG MCD, uh, the publisher of Toad, and uh, they agreed to send me the stories so that I could read them. And through the archive, I was eventually placed in touch with. Um, Dunn's son, Eli, and he let me know about the existence of Toad. Toad was not collected in the archive, but was with the family papers. And so that's when he helped get the book transcribed, and uh, then I was reading it soon after. Thank you. Hi. I'm just wondering which writers are in Catherine Dunn's lineage, like before her and after? Hmm. That's a very good question. Um, well, I think two of them are on stage. <laughs> um, I definitely think about Molly and Hallie as um, writers who embody a sense of Dunn's frankness, uh, who definitely see the world in a similar way through a similar, similar lens. Um, Another writer who I was speaking to last night, Lydia Kiesling, uh, is someone who now lives in Portland, uh, but possibly doesn't identify yet as a Portland writer. She hasn't lived there for very long. Um, but she too has um, this, this uh, proclivity for uh, grotesqueness, for a, a very raw reality, and doesn't shy away from um, you know, the shitty aspects of, of life. Um, and I think, yeah, those three writers for me really stand out. Um, do you guys have? I, I mean, I always feel I always feel a little bit like shy about saying someone is like a, in a formal lineage, and I'm not even I'm fairly sure he hasn't even read her work. But um, the Polish writer Stepan Twardoch, um, who I mention in this, um, because he's also an aficionado of boxing, um, his book The King of Warsaw uh, reminds me sometimes of Geek Club, and it's like 
pyrotechnic prose and its grotesquerie and its like wildly unreliable narrators and shifting narratives and this conclusion that just crushes you at the end. Mm -hmm. And also um, writing from the point of view of people who the author is not, but, mm -hmm. um, and, and not shying away from the cruel and horrifying aspects of that group of people too. And I, I love King of Warsaw, it's one of my favorite books and I love Stefan Twardoch's work. And though I'm sure he's not read done, I sometimes would, I would put the two of them together perhaps. Mm -hmm. You know, I feel like I, I have the same question, so I'm just listening. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? What was the hardest part about editing, Toad? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I think the hardest part may actually um, really just uh, mirror the hardest part always, which is just like knowing when to stop. Um, or maybe knowing that I had done enough. <laughs> maybe those are the same, those are similar states of um, indecision or, or uncertainty, but um, I think it really helped to be able to send the manuscript to some friends, to people at FSG, other editors, um, and hear from them that you know this book is, is not only whole and, and more complete than it was, but is really fucking good. So uh, that's when I stopped. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this might be hard, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Um, you talked about the fact that Catherine came from a working class background and the characters in the book kind of don't and the people at Reed College don't. Could you talk a little bit about the way that she deals with class in her writing? Sure, I'll take a stab at it. Um, I feel like she does this really amazing job, first of all, of like not valorizing how crap it is to work uh, working class jobs, like as a waitress at like a really you know crap place that sells donuts, for instance. Like she really um, knows intimately like how boring these jobs are, um, or how like, like what. She, she she just knows she knows what they are. She doesn't like have this idealized like the glorious proletariat thing, you know that that clueless people can sometimes do. Um, I think the second thing that um, with with Sally's character in particular is she has this kind of dual gaze where it's like both this longing for these rich kids, right, um, and desire for them, but also this contempt for them because she can see that they're like pompous nitwits who don't really know anything about the world, but she'd also really like to be in with them. Um, and so yeah, the, the desire contempt thing, um, I think is really crucial to how she, she deals with class. Yeah. I think um, this is not so much about class, but about being a broke college kid. The book starts with her getting this cheap, a little couch up into an attic and just kind of like figuring out how to do that cheaply and if you need to move pretend to sell the couch mm -hmm. and when the people come to pick it up let them carry it downstairs and then have like I'll come and yell at them and say that they're stealing the couch, <laughs> chase them away, give them their money back, and then they will have moved it downstairs for you for free. I don't know if that made sense, <laughs> but there's a lot of charm in the way that Sam, this character, is being really frugal, and then she's living in this attic that's so often described as being just like covered in cigarette ash and she <laughs> only eats cookies and drinks grape soda <laughs> it's kind of you know it's it's gross and they're broke but it's kind of nice and exciting and interesting because you're so young right you're young so i feel like i didn't feel like um so much i was sort of like I'm bogged down by how little money she has right now, Sally, in her 20s. I'm just sort of like, yeah, a little bit, in, in a way. I, I don't know. Um, it doesn't feel, I guess what I mean to say is um, it, do, it doesn't feel moralizing.
surprising so much as it just feels like intensely descriptive. Yeah, yeah, like it's real. Yeah. 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 And and I think also like it's different when she's in his twenties, right? When she's in her twenties, right? Because when you're young, like everything is awesome because you're it's young. Glamorous. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But it's like when she ages a bit, it's different. Yeah. That makes me think of uh, the description of Sam's house. Sam, who does, I guess, come oh from wealth, but is definitely yeah. sort of slumming it. It's disgusting. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> it is. It's like definitely not a place that uh, I would ever have wanted to live. Um, there's this uh, house that they live in, like a group house, I guess, uh, where um, several cats lived. And no one really knows who owns the cats or who's really responsible for them. But the cats have <laughs> pissed and shat over like every surface of the floor. So instead of cleaning it up, they just laid newspaper down, Fuck. which obviously like didn't solve the problem. The cats continue to piss and shit on top of the newspaper, so they just lay more newspaper Fuck. down, and this continues <laughs> like a baklava of cat shit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then they have to move out, and there's this you know very awful scene where they're like trying to scrape these newspapers off the floor, and it's it's so funny. But it's an excellent picture yeah, up there. Yeah, yeah. Lack of resources. Yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> so gross. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Um, I was really struck by the parallels between Dunn's life and her sort of journey through publishing and Lucia Berlin's. Hmm. Um, and that made me want to ask about um, the role of region and sort of the sort of, because uh, Berlin also wrote a lot about the West Coast and the South and other places. And it seems like, you know, the Northwest was a really important part for Dunn. Um, and so I, I, I'm wondering um, both from a sort of importance to her work perspective if you have any reflections on that, but also um, if you think that might have also played a role in sort of her um, being anathema, or at least his book being anathema to, to getting published. Yeah, um, to the second part of your question, I think it, um, it was a huge hurdle for her at times, but it was one that she probably didn't see as a hurdle. She wrote a lot about Portland. Uh, she was deeply involved in Portland's literary community, Portland's artist community. Um, I've heard countless stories from people about how like, she would buy original art, she would pay for people to submit their work to um, contests when they couldn't afford to, uh, when she didn't really even have the money. I mean, I think she just really enjoyed living in Portland, being a part of that community. And she writes about it so well. Um, so many of the short stories, uh, which I'm really excited for everyone to eventually read, um, are set in Portland and um, you know just really embody uh, a lot of the affection that she had for that place. Um, what was the first part of your question? You pretty much covered it with the oh, second part. Great, <laughs> great, thank you. I think we're we done. Yeah, yeah, I think we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much. And um, if you aren't running to get towed after that, I don't know what it'll take. But it's so good. And the bookstore has lots of copies. And if you want to uh, hang out and chat about it, please, you're welcome to. Thank you all for coming.